Well, welcome to this episode of the Good Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Good. Our guest for this episode is Dr. Karen Gillian, who is the agency's chief learning officer and OD capability lead. During our conversation, we dive deep into NASA's extraordinary efforts to cultivate its leaders, solidifying its status as the top workplace in the federal government for 11 years running. We'll unpack NASA's captivating mission and vision that touch both the head and the hearts of its workforce, igniting a culture of inspiration and unwavering commitment. Additionally, we discuss the impact of IMS and its partnership with NASA, highlighting how this collaboration is driving leadership development within the organization. So join us as we uncover the unique elements that makes the NASA model stand out as a workplace and a beacon of leadership excellence. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Good Leadership Podcast, where we engage with esteemed thought leaders and explore research-backed strategies and techniques that empower leaders at every level to achieve meaningful results that drive lasting change. Kudos to Karen, and thank you for joining us. Let our listeners know more about your background. What got you interested in this field, and, and why do you love working at NASA? So I will tell you that when I came to NASA, it was my first federal government position. So my background is working in different industries, higher education, healthcare. And I started, believe it or not, working with providing training in the IT environment. And then got such great feedback from people that I worked with, had a very supportive boss, you know, when you talk about the importance of having mentors and sponsorship and so on. So that led me into work with training and development, leadership development, organization development. So it's really been a wonderful learning journey. So my background also, I would tell you, so I am a native Clevelander. So I graduated first from Cuyahoga Community College then Notre Dame, then Baldwin Wallace. And I got my doctoral degree from Antioch University. And that focus was on leadership and change, but really trying to better understand the linkage between storytelling and leadership. But that's only, you know, when you ask me the question about my background, it doesn't stop there because I'm a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and a great grandmother. So, All of these experiences, you know, my professional work, life experiences, they come into play as I'm working with individuals, teams, and groups within the NASA environment. And who wouldn't want to work for NASA is really the way I respond to that. We have such an amazing mission. I work with some of the brightest people on the planet in supporting them. And it's it's an honor, actually, to be in this role. Wonderful. And you're right. Who wouldn't want to work for NASA? And what do you love most though, about helping leaders at NASA grow and develop? It's knowing that I have an opportunity to make a difference almost on a daily basis. And that's not an exaggeration. You know, yes, we develop um, internal leadership development programs that are highly valued and well sought after when we release a call. But at the same time, I'm also a coach. And so I have an opportunity to work with individuals. And for me, you know, you you have to really feel good about being able to make a difference, whether it's on a large scale or if it's an individual one-on-one interaction. And so that's really where my passion lies in being able to make that difference. And, you know, I told you a little bit about my background and the personal part of me. So legacy looms large for me. So it's not what I want to leave and support my family, the younger generation in terms of them being strong, caring citizens of the world. But it's also what can I do? What will I have done? you know, with my time at NASA? How will I have made it better in some way? So that's what really keeps me motivated. Wonderful. I'm so impressed with NASA and their organization and building this learning culture, the organization's commitment 
spanning those ambitious goals from moon landings to Mars explorations. It's infused in all your digital platforms and career pages that by joining your team, you're participating, whether you're a civil servant or you're in the military in the groundbreaking projects, right, that advance human knowledge and benefit humanity. That's such a, a noble and compelling mission. It's easy for me to see why so many people get engaged and want to work for NASA. Yes. The mission, you know, it, it touches it touches both your head and your heart. So that certainly is a draw. And, you know, as I said, amazing people that I work with, you know, they come because of their interest in the mission, in discovering the unknown, you know, pu pushing that envelope, trying out new ideas. So all of that is very intriguing for me. And also it's a pull, it's a driver. Well, and being recognized for the last 11 years as the best place to work in the federal government, that's just amazing. And it just shows that commitment to your people, to the talent there, and what NASA is trying to do to build this type of culture. You know, I, I will tell you that we are no different from a lot of organizations in terms of looking at budgets that may not have been, that aren't as healthy today as perhaps they once were. And I'm talking about the training budget but also knowing that you need to meet a need. You need to be creative and innovative in how you approach that. So one of the frameworks we adopted is the 70-20-10 learning model. And it's not new, it's been around for decades, but it really speaks to learning and development isn't all about that 10%, which is formal classroom learning. I'll just use that. There's a lot that goes under that umbrella, but a short definition. The 20% has to do with more of the social engagement, social interaction. So you're coaching and you're mentoring. And we certainly invest in that area, that developmental approach. But 70%, and we all know that this is true. I mean, think about our own experience. We learn best on the job. So, you know, engage me in a stretch assignment. We have details that we offer rotations, a shadowing opportunity. So that's one, that's one of the frameworks for what how we try to make things happen. It doesn't all rely on just formal classroom training. The other thing that we do is OPM has executive core qualifications. So this is where they've looked at five core qualifications and under each one are sub competencies. So we ensure that the programs that we internally develop are actually supportive of further developing those identified competencies and sub-competencies. Tell me a little bit more about how you build this leadership pipeline. You and I have talked in the past about some of these great programs, but walk our listeners through kind of how that's being developed at NASA. It's like a career growth or a career pipeline that's based on GS levels or general schedule. So this is all federal government talk, but we will start with programs for lower levels of GS employees, again, using those ECQs and placing an emphasis on what, what are the representative behaviors? What the, should they be doing performing at that particular level along this competency. And we do that for our executive development group, which is part of executive services. They have a new program that they've launched called Aspire. And so it's for the higher level of employees and those that are really looking into getting into that executive service level senior executive service level. We have a NASA FIRST program, um, which is for lower levels, GS levels. But again, you know, all of our programming is meant to really nurture and further develop leadership capability that our employees already bring. I am such a firm believer that we all have the capacity for leadership. Sometimes it's a case of recognizing where your passion lies 
and how it aligns with your values. And then it sort of like catapults you forward into that leadership role. At other times, maybe you've been promoted into a particular role and now it's it's more than just managing, right, process. It's about leading people. And so perhaps there's a gap there that needs to be closed. So I believe that everyone has the capability to be a leader. And so we work to try to first identify where the gap may be, recognizing what we have the ECQs as a guideline, and then coming up with programming and content and other support mechanisms to enable you to bridge that gap. And you also have this 2040 initiative, right? That's this strategic agency initiative to ensure NASA remains the preeminent institution for research, technology, engineering to lead science, aeronautics, and space exploration for humanity. Yes, and what I will say about NASA 2040 is that there are a number of work streams that are looking at, you know, who do we want to be as we look further out into the future as an agency? You know, you have to look at the environment that we're in. There are a lot more players involved with space. And so it's important for us to take a look at, you know, what are the, what, what should our people strategy be? Um, what is the infrastructure needs? Even a, a decision-making process. So there are a number of key areas that different work streams or working groups are looking at. And I, I have to say that sometimes people will ask, well, why 2040? And the response to that is, you know, don't focus so much on the year 2040 as much as it's a North Star, right? It's close enough where we can talk about what the vision might be. But it also allows us, if you look at that vision, to talk about, to look at current scenario, right? To look at the current status and what do we need to do? What can we, where can we get started? today in order to realize that particular vision. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that learning culture that's developed in NASA in making it such a great place to work and being able to retain and attract such great talent? I know we've touched upon it before, but is there any other details that you can add that just would give our listeners some more insight into how to build a learning culture like yours? In truth, I will say that employees that are drawn to work at NASA already come, I believe, with a sense of wanting to be this continuous learner, this lifelong learner. You know, when you're conducting research, you're you're conducting research for that reason, to discover the unknown, um, to do what someone might think is impossible today, but it is possible. So I think some of that characteristic is part of the DNA of employees. But when it comes to leadership development, I will say, you know, we've had legacy programs that so many of our senior leaders today have gone through and experienced themselves. And so they are very much strong advocates for what we do, not only our they showing up to present, uh, have discussions during the different modules, uh, sharing their lessons learned, sharing their career journey, you know, some of the highs, some of the struggles that they've encountered, serving as mentors. So they're very committed to leadership development and what it's all about. And I, you know, that certainly speaks volume when you know that the most senior person in your organization is a strong advocate for these type programs, it sends a message. Absolutely. Having that senior level support essential and you're benefiting from the fact that people are coming to your organization because they are just, they want to be a part of it, right? It's that compelling vision and mission that you've established throughout NASA's history that really brings the right kind of person in and being the fact that 
you're a continuously learning culture that kind of drives that point home as well. Let's let's talk about maybe one of the learning initiatives that maybe it's the one that we focus on for your article, um, the NASA Next program, or maybe it's one of the other ones, whichever one you want to choose. But talk to us about a certain initiative and how that's been effective at developing leaders at NASA. So I will tell you that um, the program that want, that I want to talk about is NASA Next because this was newly launched first time out, it addresses the, the larger population of employees in terms of GS level. It addresses a training leadership development need for them. And I will tell you, it's a 60 person cohort program. And we received, and I know I'm being conservative, we received well over 300 applications. So we know that the interest is there. We know that the need is there. So the program, the way we develop it, um, there are, are a number of weeks where they actually meet face to face. So again, this is where you have executives, our senior leaders that are supportive of the program because there's certainly an additional cost if you have to fund an employee to travel to go for these in-person sessions. So there are in-person sessions. In between those, there are virtual sessions where they come together. Um, there's a focus, I've already told you this, on the ECQs, different instruments. One of them I'll tell you that I'm really quite excited about is it's an intercultural development inventory. And so it's an instrument that really gauges your aspirational goal of how you see yourself in terms of interacting with cultural differences. But then it also gives you a report on what your developmental orientation is. And it's not saying, you know, you're a good person, a better person, a bad person. It's not doing that. It's simply saying you have this aspirational goal. And right now, based on the way you answered the questions, this is where you are. And so there's a gap. And, you know, it's your choice. It's optional if you want to go on this journey. So I'm really excited about that particular tool. And we've had, you know, unsolicited feedback. You know, of course, we do evaluate the program, but we've had unsolicited feedback where, you know, most recently, an individual reached out to one of the core faculty members to thank her for the honest dialogue, the coaching, the material, the content, the interactions within the cohort and how it, it has changed his life and the trajectory of his career. This is just with the first offering of this particular program and we will be launching the second offering later this fiscal year. Wow, love that success. So much demand for it sounds like almost 600 applicants. You take a small fraction of those and this really, this program is designed to increase the individual re readiness, right, for leadership into mid and senior level positions. Um, it's three modules, you, you've uh, spoken to me about those in the past. That module one is kind of that personal foundations uh, module two is business acumen, and then module three is the development planning and, and congressional ops. Um, love how it's approached um, and kind of structured, and it's amazing the amount of resources you're putting into it. I mean, some of the stats that you shared with me, over 100 hours of in-class learning from experts, 22 executive speakers, three panel discussions, over 700 plus coaching sessions and seven uh, facility tours as well. So you're putting a lot of resources into this to make it an impactful program for those participants. And, and it seems like the results are showing as a result. You know, it's work that I, I have a wonderful team that I work with. Uh, we share the same passion around this work. And so, you know, we're always sort of in the flow, right? Uh, a very long day. And at the end of the day, you're like, wow, this, this is great. We're moving the needle. That's what we all hope for, is that we move the needle on learning and development, getting people to apply more of what they've learned. 
And with that, I'd like to just kind of mention and kind of talk a little bit about how IMS has been responding to your learning needs and kind of where they have fit in into your model. So I first I want to say that I have always been impressed with the caliber of speakers, facilitators that IMS has brought in. Um, so my experience with IMS goes back to when I first started working with NASA, I was the chief learning officer at Glenn, Glenn Research Center. So at that time, and this is pre-COVID, I was able to attend a few of the in-person sessions. And not only were the facilitators excellent, the materials, the information, the exercises, the interaction, you know, when you go to these in-person sessions, well, it can happen virtually as well, but it's the connections that you make. Because it, it's, I just had someone reach out to me that I met, this is some years ago in a session and said, hey, I, you know, I hope you remember me. And he had a question, you know, and I was able to help him. So you just, again, you know, a believer in the value of relationships. When I became the agency claw, and this was in 2018, I had an opportunity, opportunity to ensure that all of the center learning officers at all of our centers, our 10 centers, not only were very much aware of IMS and their offerings, but also how to use it, how to reach out. Of course, you know, we absolutely love the complimentary, the one hour complimentary sessions, but you know, those are power pack sessions, you know, they're bite size, but you come away with at least a few, if not more of things that you can actually put into action. You know, you can apply it like right away. So really appreciate that. I've talked about, you know, the, the workshop sessions and, you know, it's not just me and my experience, but other people have shared their experience as well. But the other thing that I like about IMS and really appreciate is your willingness to partner, to collaborate. You know, there's a recognition on your part that well, the words that come to mind for me is that we're not necessarily a one size fits all. We have a really great portfolio of offerings. However, there may be a time when it's not meeting a customer or client's particular need and your willingness to partner along those lines. I mean, most recently, uh, another example of our partnership. So one of our centers, this is Kennedy Space Center. They're, they're looking at ways, programs. I mean, it's not finalized, but they're thinking about what could we offer that would supplement the agency's offering around new supervisory training development. And so two of their employees are right now currently enrolled in your new program, which is for new supervisors or managers. And that is truly a partnership because not only will it be of benefit to you, IMS, because you will get feedback from yet another customer on how that experience went, what they felt worked well, what you might want to do differently, but it also gives this particular center firsthand information on, hmm, and if we're going to do something here at our center for our supervisors, here's some things that perhaps we should consider that we hadn't thought of. So another example of, you know, very much a collaborative partnership. Oh, we love partnering with NASA. We've done it in so many different ways, like you mentioned, prior to the pandemic with those live in-person programs that we're getting back to, to a certain degree, the virtual offerings that you've been very engaged with, and then doing these private programs with you to customize it for your needs. Because at IMS, as you stated, we're all about application and connection. We want you to connect in with a community of great L&D leaders or great managers, leaders that come through our programs, but we also you know, want to make sure that you're applying more of what you've learned. And that's really what we stress with our approach. So can't thank you enough for that continued partnership that continues to grow each and every year. 
My final question really is around kind of discuss some of the issues that your employees are encountering right now when it comes to their leadership and soft skill development that might help other other listeners and members listening to say, oh, you know, this is similar to what we're experiencing as well. And and if so, if you identify some of those areas, maybe some of the things that you plan on doing in terms of solutions. So this is going to be a personal insight versus an intellectual insight. And I will explain that. I'll explain that. So we all know we, you know, we see the statistics, we see the studies that are coming out that more and more people are feeling overwhelmed and burnout. out. And so intellectually, we know this, right? I mean, we can read the data. We know what people are experiences as experiencing around us. Well, I will tell you that the all-knowing <laughs> Dr. Karen Gilliam actually succumbed to that. And, you know, last week, towards the end of the week and into the weekend, I was really burnt out and really had to step back and take some time for self-care and self-compassion. So I share that story with you to say, we are very intentional about keeping our eye on that. So it, it's a theme that runs throughout and being able to put the emphasis on well-being and that self-care self -care is something that we're doing in our programs. Uh, I may not have mentioned this earlier, but in every cohort program that we have, there are components, modules, exercises in there that focus on the self-care and well-being. So what I would say to you, Charles, is that it's not new knowledge and it's not oh, now we're going to start to do something with respect to that, it will be a continuation. We don't ever want to lose sight of that fact. And as I said, I have my own personal example of, you know, we know what we should be doing, but sometimes that not only do I call myself a, a recovering perfectionist, but maybe I'm a recovering workaholic as well. And I need to be better about that. And that would be my message to anyone listening to our conversation, that the work that we do is admirable. The missions that we support um, capture both our head and our heart in such a deeply felt way, deep, deeply knowing way. But don't lose sight of the fact that you do need to put yourself on your list of priorities and take care of yourself. Well said and great advice, especially in NASA where everyone feels compelled for that mission, right? And it causes you just to work harder, work longer, work more. Love how you also incorporate the well-being and burnout issues within the development offerings that you provide. So you're not just dismissing those. You're not saying, yes, we know they're important. You're actually putting action into what you're saying by incorporating that piece into all the development offerings to make sure that your workforce is taken care of, right? Both physically, mentally, and emotionally, which is a great thing to hear. Yes, we are intentional about that. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining me today, Dr. Karen Gilliam. Really appreciated our conversation. I know our listeners will get a lot of insight into what NASA is doing and all the great things that are happening there that's that's probably going to, for the next foreseeable future, continue to make it the best place to work in the federal government. Remind our listeners how they can get in contact with you if they have any further questions. Well, I certainly don't mind anyone reaching out to me at my NASA email. That's karen.l.gilliam at nasa.gov. I hope this episode has provided you with valuable insights. If it has, I ask you to share it with someone who would also benefit from it. If you've been enjoying and gaining knowledge from this podcast, then subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find all the previous episodes of the podcast and additional learning resources. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple or Spotify and leave up to a five-star review.